Artificial intelligence. <laughs> that's, that's how you're going to start this. You can start this by saying the words artificial intelligence. <laughs> artificial intelligence. Go, Joe. 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 Oh, you, Joe. Can you just be like, look, I'm going to turn it over to our artificial intelligence, Joe Sanger. Go, Joe. I think it's a good thing. You're listening to Two Beers Until Phrenesis, a philosophy podcast by students and graduates. Whether you've never heard of philosophy or have a philosophy PhD, we hope you enjoy these conversations as we discuss some of life's big questions over a few beers. Enjoy. I know nothing about AI, specifically, like, I... I think that philosophy tends to get overlooked in these kinds of questions sometimes, at least the potential's there. So um, we can get we can get onto that kind of stuff. And uh, I want to kind of just host this and let you just unleash your fucking weaponized autism. <laughs> so <laughs> weapons yes, great. Um, I'm going to basically just ask a bunch of questions. I my research was basically I looked at, at a couple of studies, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia and. Of philosophy, and then I looked at Wikipedia for a bit yesterday afternoon. So I know literally nothing. So I'm basically going to be an audience surrogate, and I'm just going to ask you guys a few questions and uh, keep bringing the conversation back to philosophy. Um, so my first question would be: So obviously that there's um, I looked at there's like kind of three def- correct me if I'm wrong, but three definitions of AI. Kind of you've got like the basic kind of AI, which is problem solving, logistical stuff. Then you've got the kind of AI that is programmed to sort of register emotions and communicate on a kind of moral level. And then from that, and we're kind of going to bracket this last thing and not discuss it, but like the whole idea of conscious AI. So you're talking about like levels of consciousness? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no, there's no def- strict definition of it, really. Yeah. The The general idea is that Artificial intelligence is supposed to uh, do things that humans can, which they previously couldn't, in terms of... you. <laughs> so something called the Turing test, which is basically to see if you can eventually trick a person into believing they're conversing with another human, when they're in fact conversing with a machine. So it's one of the primary goals of AI is to be able to emulate that in yeah. a uh, reliable fashion, I guess. Yeah. But I think, yeah, when, when we're talking about, like, truly conscious AI, we're going to basically bracket the, the idea of consciousness because it, it, it deserves its own podcast. It deserves five podcasts, to be honest. We're not going to solve consciousness in this little fucking room. Yeah, um, I don't know, we can do a pretty good crank. Especially if we got the, <laughs> the length of five podcasts as well. I mean, a, a point I should make first is like AI as a definition in itself is pretty broad and highly contested. Yeah. And depending who you ask, they're going to give you a different de- definition. Um, I mean, even John McCarthy, the guy who actually came up with the term in the 50s, um, artificial intelligence, has been quoted saying, like, the problem with the, the term AI is that every time a, a software it ends up being able to accomplish something that no longer becomes AI, as far as pe- the way people define yeah. it, and the goalposts keep shifting with what we're calling AI. And that's why when Joe says that he's doing machine learning, that tends to be a more... When people want to actually talk about what they're actually doing in, in terms of AI research, they generally will use terms like machine learning because that's more specific. So we're actually talking about a part of um, part of the industry rather than like this very vague term. Yeah. Yeah. So with like voice translation and stuff, that that kind of stuff is in the past now. That's that's like rec- the recognition of voice and like transcribing that voice recognition has been around since the early 90s now yeah the problem is then what people tend to do is once that becomes a sort of part of what people would call artificial intelligence or you know the examples of um these algorithms becoming intelligent it's they they start shifting the goalposts say well actually what what we're looking for is a more general or broader intelligence and and the the problem is it isn't a very well-defined idea and even the word intelligence is more or less in the eye of the beholder like you can say well you know, you're more intelligent than a tree, but that's depending on how you're defining intelligence. Because, you know, your goals can, you can accomplish a different set of goals like to a, um, to an AI that can just, just play chess. You can do more things than an AI that can just play chess, for example. 
Um, but it, if it can play Jess way better than you, that's a form of intelligence, but that's a, that's a narrow form of intelligence. But then again, when we're using the word intelligence here, that depends entirely how you're defining it. Some people will define it in the broadest possible terms, which is just the ability to accomplish goals. Um, and so you could say, well, a tree is able to accomplish a goal in some sense, so it has some form of intelligence. It's not, it's not an inanimate object, it's not a rock. A rock has no intelligence whatsoever. <laughs> and some will say, well, there has to be some degree of complexity in there. It has to be the ability to solve complex goals or whatever, whatever else. Um, but yeah, you can you can see how it's it is very difficult concept to sort of get your get a grasp on to be able to actually define and unpack. Um, that's why terms like machine learning are generally more used when actually talking specifically about um, certain aspects of yeah you know, this kind of technology. Absolutely, because that, that that effect that you mentioned effectively that with the AI effect according to Tesla is defined by. AI that isn't AI that has already been created effectively is is something that is new, is then considered AI, but like advanced level. So yeah, it's I think Te- I think Tesla came up right one. Yeah, it's it's such a fast moving field that like things that ten years ago would have been considered AI, we have pretty much got like a hold on now. Hmm. So like there was once upon a time, and it wasn't even that long ago really, where a computer would not be able to tell the difference between a dog and a cat. And then it could do that, and now it could tell the difference between a man and a woman. Yeah, you, you can get, um, and so get images described to you by AI now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, so what, what are the kind of things that we're trying to do with AI now? What are the, what's, the, what's on the table now? Well, I'm supposed to open up that line of talk. I, I guess some of the main applications, at least, well, some of the main buzz right now in AI is is machine learning in the sense of, and as Joe alluded to, he works with what's called supervised uh, machine learning. Broadly speaking, you have supervised, you have reinforcement learning, and you have unsupervised learning. Um, and all three of these have different applications depending on what you're trying to do. Even, I think it was like the, uh, towards the end of 2016, we had a game like uh, Go, which is you know, a, a Chinese board game that has so many sort of future permutations that people didn't think that a computer was going to be able to beat a human at it because of how quickly the um, decision trees propagate outwards exponentially. Um, but what ended up happening was they started using, um, at first I believe it was supervised a supervised learning system that employed things called neural networks, which, which we'll get into in a minute, I guess, because that's another thing to unpack. Yeah. Um, in, with supervised learning, it uses training data, so it uses data that's given to it, um, so it can gradually learn and get better, and this can be done either through backward propagation in a neural network, which we can talk about in a minute, or through genetic algorithms, but not really in this case, since that's a bit more expensive. And it was able, over a very short amount of time, to beat the world's best Go player. And then since then, like not even a year and a half later, um, they started building unsupervised neural networks that were actually that became capable of not only destroying the previous iteration of AlphaGo, as it was called, but were also able to become more generalized, which and it was actually able with the same the same system um, to both become the best chess player and the best Go, Go player with the same AI, um, mm. and also it was um, it was using a thing called unsupervised learning, which is where the AI essentially plays against itself and keeps playing against itself. Uh, so, of, so kind of self-learning, but in a narrow context. Yeah. Refining right. its approach. Yeah. But yeah. what was kind of scary about AlphaGo Zero was that it was they were starting to break through into a more general context. In a sense, it was no longer just an AI that was entirely just designed to right. um, beat people at Go, but it was also that the same AI could then start to learn um, how to beat people on chess as well, and you know it was a multi-purpose. Still AI. a pretty rule-driven, visible game, though, isn't it? It's still it's kind of similar. Yes, but it's the, the yeah, point there's, is there's that, a lot of yeah, games, like, the yeah. translation across it's not two like mediums. Yeah. Yeah. Into something else, well, but the important thing is the way in which it was doing it is fundamentally different to how an old chess engine would do it. Deep but Blue was a lot different. Yeah. Deep Blue, there's a lot of controversy about Deep Blue because um, a lot of people didn't deem it as artificial intelligence, and they basically realised when Kasparov played Deep Blue again, so he initially won in 96, but then they played again in 97, mm. and um, you know, things were happening, like, okay, the computer glitched, which actually kind of threw off Kasparov, he, he misinterpreted it as advanced intelligence, when it was just a bug in the programming system, but um, he wasn't happy, not because he lost in the rematch, but he thought that there were three other grand chess masters that intervened 
between each of the six matches effectively. So there's kind of a lot of controversy around the old systems. But no, was, I didn't realise that um, there was this you know, this new infrastructure that could actually master Go and chess simultaneously, right. all through different systems. I should probably hand it off to Joe because you've done some studying in neural networks. Yeah, as as I yeah. so good. I'm using it in credit scoring. So typically, if somebody comes and applies for a credit product, say a credit card, what happens is we go to the bureau to get their information. So these would be things like, how many payments you've missed recently, how many like, other credit cards you've got, whatever. There'll typically be like maybe eight to 10 of these or more. Are these what we would call variables. So these all go into a neural network. And then effectively what it does is just measure all at once the interactions between them. So the first layer of a neural network, if you like, it's basically just a load of nodes and it'll take the variables and it'll see any correlations between those variables. So for example, the older you are, Typically, the, the longer you will have had accounts open, that makes sense. You can't have an account open for years and years and years and if you're quite young. And it'll measure all that stuff. And then that would be an example of a linear model, which is what is typically uh, logistic regression, linear regression, those examples of linear models. Where a neural network really comes into its own is that you can then build in more and more of these layers. So then you can mash together secondary interactions. So you can mash together sort of interactions of interactions called multivariate interactions. Mm -hmm. It basically gets extremely complicated, extremely quickly. Everything's all being smashed together, um, and at each at each node, there's a mathematical function that will basically kind of scale that and give that a weight. Mm. Basically, at the end of the network, it will come out with a best guess prediction of what it is. So this is a supervised network, which means that we're giving it data that it knows, and it knows what it's trying to look for. In this case, are they going to default on the credit card or whatever? And it will give a weighted average between yes or no. Right. And, and so then, at first, when you shove this network into the task of weighing this yeah. thing, what's likely to happen is it's going to come out with a load of noisy crap that has nothing to do with the answer you want. But yeah. you have the data, you, you're feeding it data where you know what the right answer to the data is. Yes. This is what supervised learning is. Yes. Um, and at first, it won't know what the hell's going on, but then, yeah, you change the weights of the certain parts of the neural network by doing back, backwards propagation and... Yeah, so yeah. backwards propagation is is the is the learning part of the machine learning, I guess. Heavily quote marks on the learning bit, which I explain it without maths. Yeah. It's really difficult. <laughs> it is very difficult. But yeah the, yeah, the point is when it's fed training data, backwards propagation is where it goes back and it changes. There's a couple other things it changes. It's an oversimplification, but it, it changes the weights of how the neurons will interact with each other, sort of. So yeah. it's more likely for some neurons to fire than others and you keep feeding it back the data and it keeps adjusting it so that the test, the accurate test data is correlated with what you would expect if you were to feed it something that it wouldn't know the answer to and it would get closer and yeah. closer. So the, I think the key point is that because it's supervised, you know the answer you're looking for and you can measure the, the error effectively in what it gets. Mm -hmm. You can say, okay, you thought it was, had a, they had a 40% chance of defaulting and they actually had a 20% chance. Let's try and reduce that error and you go back through the network backwards and you say, okay, we're at this node, maybe you should have come from this node instead, and you go back like that on an, on an aggregate yeah. level, obviously. Do <coughs> some mass, readjust yeah. the weights, do it again, you reiterate that X times or however until yeah. you get within your threshold. Um, the danger is, if you did this forever to try and get a really, really refined answer, you'd be amazing on your data set. You would be able to predict every single account if they were going to default eventually and you give it some new data and it will fail completely because it has been so overfitted to that particular population. Right. It's niched too much into Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it will start looking for patterns that don't really exist in the actual world that it's right. found in your particular training sample. Yeah. So basically the problem with AI is the lack of general intelligence. It's, it's, it can be a problem. It's, yeah, it is a problem inherent to AI and machine learning. It, it's, it's present in all types of modeling, but particularly machine learning because of this iterative process that effectively the learning aspect of it is you just refresh the parameters a lot and you use the error yeah. from because you know what you're looking for because it's supervised to refresh i don't really i'm not too familiar with that uh, unsupervised machine yeah, learning. the cutting edge stuff at the moment is the reinforcement side which is um Semi, sort of also called semi-supervised learning and also unsupervised learning which is these neural networks which by the way are sort of modeled 
or at least originally theoretically modelled on the human brain. It was, um, I think the name Warren McCulloch and uh, Walter Pitts uh, back in the 40s were like who cognitive scientists who were thinking of ways that, that you could, in theory, have a machine do similar things to what the neurons of a brain are doing. And there were lots of sort of theories about how these could be implemented and whatever. And I think it was back, it was, I think, roughly in the mid 60s or probably a bit earlier, actually, a guy called Frank Rosenblatt um, made this the first thing called a perceptron. Right. So it's called, and this this thing was able to um, cool. recognize. Basically, it was sounds like, like an enemy on Doctor Who. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like the very first neural network. Essentially, it was like the very sort of premature um, neural network, which was able to be fed pictures of of people, and it would output a boolean value that's just like a one or a zero, basically male or female. And it was, and it would be trained with date with pictures that it would see of of this data. And this was yeah. again supervised learning where. Um, it, it would be told whether it was right or wrong and the values in the neural network would be adjusted um, to match more the actual case was until it could actually predict it properly. Um, fast forward, and I mean, throughout the 70s and 80s, a lot of this technology actually very much like dropped out of favour and people were pretty didn't really think it was actually going to be a big thing. And I think a lot of funding kind of fizzled out. Yeah, I read that. I came across that, um, yeah. Yeah, and there was, it was what's called an AI winter. I think it was Marvin Minsky who yeah. coined that term. Um, AI winter during the 70s where it sort of there was a lot of you know hype about AI and AI was going to become this general intelligence as it's called and we'll get to how you define what a general intelligence is yeah um in, in during the 70s but it kind of it just didn't really there was like a lot of ex- um expectations that weren't met and people kind of lost interest and especially neural networks and things like this were kind of then cast aside and go well this is just not the future and it wasn't really until you know, the, the 2000s and a bit later on, when people were like, started to have the processing power and whatnot to make these systems properly viable. Yeah, during the 90s, speech recognition, the classic example of um, being able to recognize handwritten text, uh, the postal, I think in the 90s, even postal services were using um, these neural networks to be able to recognize addresses on parcels and do that, do much of that process yeah. automatically. Um, and fast forward a bit further, and now then you get to stuff like reinforcement learning and unsupervised learning, which is slightly different. Um, again, like I'm, my, my maths on this is not, not great. With an unsupervised AI um, or with an unsupervised neural network, what it's doing is instead of having test data, which is comparing its results against and changing its weights based on that, um, it's essentially updating models of whatever the challenge is by uh, by essentially playing against itself in a, in some kind of challenge. And then what it will do. Um, so say if it's chess, which is what um, one of the first uh, Google DeepMind projects was about, um, to try and beat chess even better than just one of these AIs that basically just looks ahead through loads of different decisions and picks, picks an optimal decision. And what it would do in, in, in an unsur- unsupervised training scenario is it would just play itself over and over and over again. But each time it would stochastically, as it's called, just basically randomly slightly change certain parameters within the neural network. And the better, the, more, the neural networks that would win more and more and more um, and sort of change randomly and then they would win, they would they would be passed on to the next sort of generation. It was sort of like this almost sort of genetic algorithm going on where okay. at first they play chess against each other. I said play like five times. You play chess against each other. They just like don't know what the hell they're doing. They just like, you know, just do a king rush or something. That's or something. Like how I play yeah, they just yeah. try random stuff. But eventually, if you keep selecting the networks that even though they're trying random stuff, they might, you know, they might get more successful than other ones. And you keep selecting those ones that are more and more successful as these two neural networks are playing each other. And mm-hmm. essentially what they they can do this just th- tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, depending on how much computing power you have, they can play against themselves thousands of times in iterations in you know in, in a matter of minutes and just keep feeding these generations and, and exponentially improve at playing chess and that's sort of vaguely what unsupervised learning would be and there's sort of reinforcement which is kind of like a middle ground where you where you give it sort of goals it's also there's also called like q learning which is right. where you give uh, an ai certain rewards or even you can give it sort of de incentives to do something and it's sort of um, if it, again, there's like this sort of randomization process, and the better generations are able to collect those sort of gradual rewards, um, uh, will be selected and continued. And it, it'll, it'll keep optimizing and optimizing and optimizing, and that's how you get like some of these crazy neural networks that are able to do things that 
just look amazing and also because they, they often become so complicated and are using like quite crazy computational power <laughs> if you actually try to understand what the network's doing it's a bit of a black box it's like it just tends to be sort of values going to values and there's, and there's you know there's a lot of them um, and it's very difficult to sort of really understand exactly how it's you know drawing the conclusions it is so there's this massive unsupervised like industrial form of trial and error effectively yeah, exactly. it's like at an exponential yeah. rate the more patterns it learns and and it is glorified trial and error ultimately yeah. Yeah. Well, well sensible trial and error because you're readjusting the weights in a, in a sensible way yeah. yeah but yeah I think a good way to think about a difference between <laughs> supervised and unsupervised is that supervised is unknown data with a known target by which I mean so it's designed to just take in new data but it knows what it's looking for whereas unsupervised is it's basically only going to see one set of data in its lifetime yeah it doesn't know what it's looking for, but it's trying to find parallels and groupings within that. So a good example of where this is used a lot is in marketing. So with marketing and advertising, there are actually surprisingly little restrictions on what they can do in terms of reg regulatory things. So they can just build models straight away and chuck them out there and basically just let them see what they can find. So I'm sure you're all aware of targeted ads. Like when you Google something yeah. and it pops up in your ads two seconds later, would not be surprised at all if that's a result of neural networks that are being used to just basically track yeah. your entire yeah. digital history. Well, and when you when you see those oh. capachas or whatever they're called, I can't remember really how you pronounce them. The yeah. ones where you have to, to prove your humour. Well, it's captures. <laughs> yeah. But what's funny about it is have you have you noticed how a lot of them are to do with roads and driving and signs and things like Yeah. They're getting day test data for AIs to be able to mm. better understand things by having mm. correct results from humans as test data to feed back into oh, their neural networks. So it's like a That's lot of these cool. are actually ways Wait of harvesting data. <laughs> and obviously Google with you know the self-driving cars and everything yeah, which I'm yeah. sure we'll get to. Like that's a big part of yeah. probably how they harvest data for that. Um, yeah. yeah. Well it's yeah talking about self-driving cars, I remember saying to you recently there's been a call, probably an exaggerated call, for philosophers to weigh in on basically had a program, a self-driving car. I don't think it's over. No. Really. I think it's very important, actually. Oh, okay. enough. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was exaggerated by philosophers. Yeah. They were like, you know, the people in the crowd go, what about the was philosophy? The, yeah, <laughs> the track thing. They're like, what about yeah. that? The trolley problem. So You it, should hire you, some philosophers. Are you guys familiar with the trolley problem? Yeah. yeah. Basically, yeah. Um, Zach, are you familiar with it? Um, Just say you're not, because no. then I can explain it for, for the benefit of the audience. <laughs> no, Connor, I'm not. Please explain. Uh, so it's it's just, me, Jeremy Clarkson talks about it on Top Gear. Yeah. Do you, uh, yeah, do you pretty refresh it? All right. Well, basically, um, Top Gear. trolley, train, tram, it's <laughs> heading towards uh, potentially two different uh, sets of people. So um, oh, yeah. a, a runaway home, train. Yeah, a homeless person yeah. is caught in the tracks, and you can swerve it to him to save the five nuns or whatever or the, the orphans or the fucking the, the puppies <laughs> so <laughs> that's the that's the, yeah, that's the sound of a lever right. being turned unquestionably yeah it, it throws up an interesting idea it's like so is that's the the utilitarian answer to that which is how most things are probably going to end up programmed because that's how most decisions end up being made on a sort of corporate level is you know it's one person is less of a sacrifice than Five. ten, or mm -hmm. you know, and it's and a lot of people try and throw in questions like, well, maybe the homeless person has the cure to cancer. Now what? Now what do you do? A lot of people say, well, maybe by uh, sort of omitting action, you're not participating, so therefore it's it's not your the sort of Kantian view. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, it, it's, but then you know, I, I I actually believe that omission is it's like you wouldn't walk past a a pond and see someone drowning and just go well. If I don't act, it's not, you know, yeah, you jump it's in. Natural selection is fine, it's you just wouldn't do that just instinctively. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know, if you're drowning in a pond, it's like... Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> it's oh, like, I don't want to get wet. <laughs> how, how, how cold is this day? This would be very unpragmatic. Yeah. So, basically, <laughs> you might get a bit sick. 16% mm -hmm. chance of success. And there's like one, of the, one of the more interesting ones. So, obviously, most people would pull a lever in one way or another. Yeah. And most people would also agree that probably choosing to not pull a lever isn't is in itself a moral decision. You don't get to just bypass the decision by not acting. Not acting is also a decision. Yeah, by walking away, you're acting. Um, but um, yeah, weighing up sort of consequentialist uh, morality is, is basically where this is leading. And it's like, well, how the fuck do you program like a self-driving car? If, if it's faced with two choices, what algorithm do you possibly give it and what, on what premise is it making those decisions? Right. Basically, you have to invent morality. Well, so to, we have, we have to yeah. give it. You have to give machines morality. 
So that you have to pass that on. You have to understand reality in a way you can. Probably yeah, and I, it, just, I, it doesn't have to have. So it has, it to, be, has it to have it an has ethical framework. I suppose is the better better way to put it. Yeah. Um, so I'm to set this set this up so it's clear yeah. as a thought experiment. Then how, how can you um, have an ethical framework that isn't utilitarian? Well, we'll explain that mm, because, yeah. because you don't necessarily have to. But so let's set up the thought, thought experiment first. So you have a self-driving car. You have to program this self-driving car to have an ethical system. Why? So you could have a situation where you're on the motorway, the self-driving car has to make a decision between so it's in a situation where it could have it could swerve and kill someone, it could it could swerve and kill someone on a bike, it could it could swerve this way, it could kill like one person, yeah. it could kill an old person, it could save you, it could it could cause it could do kill the least number of people, but there's it's in a situation where it has to do some kind of maneuver in which whatever the outcome, there's going to be something that is there's going to be an undesirable out- outcome no matter what happens. And it has to choose um, which undesirable. And you have to figure wants. out, and the problem that has to be figured out is is what ethical system do you program it with? Yeah. Like, I mean, think about having cars that they talk to each other. So it's like right. there, there'd be five cars in a row, and all Convoys, five, all, yeah, yeah or, or it's like all like not even that. Let's say let's say there's like a street of cars. Yeah, they start in concert, and you, and you have like fifteen cars. All fifteen cars will be receiving the data from the car in front. Yeah. So the car goes, oh shit. We need to stop, and then they go stop, 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 stop. Right, so by, no, by having yeah. them connected, you actually get around that problem. Right, but you, so, you so don't you, get around you, the problem. You can well, you, you because do, there's going to be situations where there's going to have to be stops, problems. It stops, I think it's it more stops like problems of you like swerving or like yeah. stopping, and then another car not stopping, and you smash. Right. It's like pileups. Like the worst accidents of pileups are on the motorway. Yes. Yeah, so, so like so someone like that just almost gets alleviated by having like cars communicate. Right. With there's, each other. there's two assumptions there. There's one that this is already we're in a situation where all cars are self-driving. Two. Yeah, the other problem yeah, is probably. you're assuming that there's there's nothing random could possibly happen. It's the principle. Any ethical it's, it's the principle. I'm not. I'm not, yeah. I'm not saying that. Like, it's like, it's, like, it's, so, it's so, like, yeah. How do you? There, there would be there would be like it wouldn't it, like a car accident wouldn't look the same as it looks now. Yeah. It, obviously, that's like so. It's like there's obviously factors that we won't know that we can factor right. in. It's, it's, it's how you yeah. create the choice, which is like because right. this is the problem. Because like most people who buy a car would want a car that actually is programmed with an ethical system that basically says save the driver save at all me, costs. Yeah. yeah, even if it's a but this is the problem, it's like, but is that really the right way to do it because of you know all the ethical considerations. Or it's trying to buy a car that kills me. Yeah, who's gonna yeah. buy a suicide <laughs> car? <laughs> <What's> <laughs> the no one's, yeah. gonna, no one's nah. gonna buy a fucking suicide car, are they? This car is programmed to in the in the right situations end your fucking yeah. life. <laughs> that's 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 car. part of the that's part of the new driverless car model. Yeah. No, there, there, there is there, there is another conundrum which I think probably could be resolved. I still don't see many people looking to the problem you, you would face on, say, a mini roundabout. This isn't like a moral perspective; it's more kind of a pragmatic sense. Three, three points on the mini roundabout. Each has to give way to the right, respectively. Yeah. Do the cars just disintegrate, panic, and blow up, or do they all <laughs> in synchronization move around? Respectively, at the same well, the, time, the, the, or is one system imagine, more advanced than around. the other system on the other side, and therefore there's kind of like a yeah, complete, you wouldn't yeah. want like the fucking voxel <laughs> voxel self driving thing, because like imagine if they just like like they looked at like Tesla for the self driving, and then voxel went yeah we'll do that, but you know it's a bit expensive, yeah, we'll, 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 chop we'll, get, we'll chop off that, and then like, oh we'll just program a little suicide mode in there, <laughs> <laughs> just, you know I mean? just like all these, all I, these don't, I don't I don't. Shareholders were looking to that. Well, no, 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 but it's like it's like they do it with cars. Like there's a certain there's a certain amount of cars that just break down or like have like massive faults before they like do a recall. Was, was it Vauxhall that did the carbon emissions test? No, that was uh, uh, Volkswagen. Was Volkswagen. Volkswagen. Yeah. So, so what if they just straight yeah. up either the system isn't as good or they just lie and then just pump it out there? Well, well yes, that's, that's another that's another consideration. Is, is, are yeah. all these AI frameworks going to have to be programmed with the same ethical framework to be able to actually function yeah, in the most ethical possible? Probably. They're, they're like you're gonna have to probably though, start programming everything in the, the same, or you're gonna have even oh, the worst no, this possible. Is, this is like a yeah, fucking yeah. class um, system where you get the Mercedes yeah. that kills everyone apart from you, but you and your pro car. I am Mercedes driver. Then. <laughs> yeah, literally, no, but literally, that's that's the way I was thinking when you're thinking like, oh, mm. the, the homeless people are nuns. I imagine there'll be people who will have like. It's a bit dystopian, but they'll have like higher credentials, and you have like a little tag on them that feeds into the AI. So it says, "Oh, don't kill this person." <coughs> China. This, this person's a doctor. <laughs> yeah, literally. Yeah. This, this person's well, a doctor. Yeah. Don't, don't run over the doctor. Just run over everybody. Run over already. the student. <laughs> it's literally yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so you just have you just have like a little thing that just like emits like a sort of yeah. radar, no, like, I, a, like a fucking QR code, but for AI. Yeah. Go, yeah. Well, I, this I, guy's I, got ten <laughs> worth points, whereas this guy's got a hundred worth points. Yeah. I, I, I don't I don't think that like culturally we understand ethics 
very well anyway. And I think <clears> most <throat> generally we just tend to think in a very basic utilitarian sense of what is the best outcome. We don't think in terms of intentions or character. We... But then you give someone a thought experiment by the Charlie problem and suddenly they stop becoming a utilitarian. Yeah. And that's yeah, the interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. thing. Is suddenly yeah. the, the parameters change depending on what. You know, yeah, very, very very few philosophers are how utilitarians you... in the very most basic sense. Most of them are well, something else. But what other framework would you put in for a car? It's like exactly. The, like, that, I don't think. Like, yeah, the, the only one you can sort of like like we can all sort of get our heads around the utilitarian <laughs> the, the, vir- the virtuous car, the virtue ethics. It's like you can't really the, the well, complexity yeah. of ethics can't it's be like, communicated. Well, into pro- it. program a car to be the best possible car. It's like yeah, you know, it's just, it's these, these are existential ideas yeah. that don't I, communicate. Does that machines. Say be a good I, I, car. I, yeah. <laughs> also, it's just like also we might just get rid of cars. We might just become like some sort of big public transport thing. Jetpacks. What a train! Like, I want to come back to your point actually, where like you just said program them. car to be the best car. So there's I can't remember the name of the fucking thing, but it's like something to do with a paperclip. Yeah, from Danny Bell. Oh, so it's, yeah, it's Nick, yeah. Nick Bostrom. It's a paperclip fallacy yeah. where you program a machine and yeah. its sole purpose is to make paperclips. Yeah. That's what so. you try to do. That's its primary goal above all costs. And then one day it starts making paperclips. You give it anything, it makes paperclips. One day it learns for itself that, well, humans aren't making me make enough paperclips. I'll kill all the humans and I'll make them into paperclips and I'll start making everything well, else into paperclips. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the idea that you program with a particular driver, and this is one of the arguments, yeah. I guess against AI, probably, is how you would spin that. So uh, it's, this is what's it's called perverse instantiation. It kills you. Um, and the, the, it's, it's, this is an idea, I don't think it was Nick Bostrom, it might have been Nick Bostrom, who was an AI Swedish AI researcher. First, at least he's where most people have come across it. Um, the paperclip machine, basically. And the point is, it is, it's a thought experiment about a general intelligence AI. So an AI that is actually as smart or more, or more intelligent in a broader sense than human beings are. And then the scenarios, you, the problems you have is if you program an AI like this with goals that are slightly misaligned with ours, un- without realizing you've done that, it's you can no have, problems. especially with systems that are super intelligent, you can end up having a knock-on effect that you won't predict, you won't be able to understand or predict. Um, so Nick Bostrom's um, thought experiment was, yeah, paperclip machine. And the idea was you tell a super intelligent AI to make as many, you know, be really efficient, make me loads of paperclips, make paperclips. Um, so what it's going to first, you know, it's first going to start making factories, whatever. And it's like, and it's like, oh great, yeah, loads of paperclips. But then, but then, but then you realise, like, an AI, it's not, it's the maleficence isn't there. It, but what it's going to end up doing is converting everything in the universe into paper. It's going to not stop converting things to paperclips because the point was you gave it the goal of doing that, and if that means it has to kill people to get more paperclips, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to do that because that's its goal. And that's, and that's again, it's like this slight misalignment of a goal that you've programmed it to have without uh, having a proper parameterization of that goal can lead to like unforeseen consequences on a super intelligent AI. But yeah, you know, well, I think this is this is most that. people's um, kind of idea of AI. You mentioned the. Um, the AI, AI winter, and I the, one of the studies I read was looking at AI in fiction, right. and um, it's it's strange. We're back when AI was this promising kind of field. Um, there are obviously films like The Matrix and, Ter- and Terminator and things, and it's only recently, we've more and more, but uh, comparatively less so, we've been seeing positive takes on AI. I mean, I'm more talking about conscious AI here, but not necessarily. The whole idea of the dystopia and everything, it's predominantly when AI is used as a narrative device in fiction, it's this, it's a malevolent force. Right, well, then what I would say to that is, so if you try to think of good examples of AI in film and literature, normally they're going to be side characters or not related to the plot, RTD2. Yeah, so exactly, you know, yeah. Part of the Humans problem with, with, with this idea is the framework for a story that is about, that is framed around, the plot is framed around AI, you can't really write, it's difficult to write a story about that good that, stuff. About good, about, you know, because the point is it's about um, a danger of AI or something that the, the protagonist has to go through that's going to be challenging. Well, yes. you know, that's some, some that's yeah, that's, 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 that's the conflict, yeah, sure. But if, if the AI is a side thing, it's much easier to make it, like, if it's just part of the story that yeah. isn't actually integral to the conflict I was, think, I was thinking into Stellar and things like that, yeah. 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 Where something in the like real world, awesome like, thing, you know, good AIs don't make great news. Scary yeah. AIs, yeah. fear-mongering. Yeah. Nearly, that's yeah. 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 nearly all films are based on sensationalism. Yeah, the classic kind of three-tier to the plot. There is there is a problem, and then the protagonist then solves mm. the problem. Then they all live happily after. If there was if perfect, if society was in perfect equilibrium, everyone was in harmony, there wouldn't be that. Problem. That's why you'd see more negativity 
portrayed through these well, films. It'd be the shittest film in the world, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, nothing with, would with no it. conflict. It'd be, Keanu, it'd be Keanu Reeves with his hands in his pockets, walking with that. What's, what's the name of the last from Matrix? Trinity. Yeah. yeah. And they like, swallow the, the. Isn't the Matrix lovely? Meal. Yeah. <laughs> the end. <laughs> we had tea yeah. and cake all, all day long. So, so the question Incredibly. I wanted to ask really is: Are these fears grounded in any kind of reality? Because I think they they do yes. pretty much represent the popular conception of AI. Yeah, I mean, like this is the thing: is is what you'll find is in terms of AI researchers, um, the camps are very evenly split, and they're split all over the place. You get, you're going to find everything from basically the futurist camp, which is more the people who are very pro sort of AI. You think AI is going to be very beneficial to humanity and all these sort of things. You've got Kurzweil and all, the, all these sort of people in that sort of camp. And then you've got um, the more sort of sceptical camp, which are people that don't think... Um, um, Stephen Hawking. Again, I'm going to use the word, a new word, singularity. Uh, but we're going to say what that is in a minute, but sort of pre and post singular, AI singularity that, um, in fact, this idea of a general AI or an AI, that a super intelligent AI coming about is actually nowhere near as close as people think it is or it's not going to be nowhere near as much of a problem as they think it is. Um, and then you've also got the camp of people that think, um, yes, it's, well, actually, the near and far are, are different camps as well because you can have people who think that AI is great but it's far away or great but close. But then you also have the people who think that AI is potentially a very serious danger. Yeah, chron- super intelligent. chronological proximity and... Um, Danger, yeah. Yeah, and what, what I, factors, yeah. yeah. One, one thought experiment I do really like about the AI getting out of the box, and this is this is from um, Max Tegmont's three, Life Point Three Point Oh. I can't remember the original guy who originated this thought experiment, but the idea is it's like imagine you are um, you're an adult as you are, and you're you're locked, you're locked in a prison, imagine. right? And there's loads of like preschool kids everywhere, oh, and, yes. then they, <laughs> and, they, and they um. And they, they come up to you and they're so like, they're like oh, can you help us? Can you help us with... Um, you're, you're way smarter than us. Can you help us like accomplish this? Can you show us how to do agriculture? Work? And it's like, you, you know, these kids are just kind of, can you describe to us how to... like? And you're like, I can't describe it to you. I, I need to get out to describe how yeah, to make, yeah. you know. It's like, well, if I just got out of this prison, then I could show you how to do these things. And it's like, and the point is, it's like, we we could potentially be like the preschool kids and we could ask it, we could think that this intelligent AI is like, um, you know, accidentally incentivize it to get out of the box because it's going to be looking at us like, what? Yes, like if you just let me do it, then I can I can like show you how to um, do all these things you're requesting of me. But I have to get out of this box first. But that that, that works um, on the assumption that an AI is still in a box because it's a lot of things like a lot of like learning comes from being in a body. So there's a sensible way to. Oh, sorry, I should, I should yeah, yeah, specify yeah. the term in the so, box is, is so, what so generally people be, say. It, when it would be, it'd be like, sh- like shackling, like limitations on. Yes, yeah, so, 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 so a lot, of learning, escape, a lot of learning basically. would be to be able to interact with objects. That would, that would enable like a, a huge amount of learning potential. So it's like that's yeah. got to be a way that they would. I did, I did want to come back well, to that it's, later. It's less it, literal. Yeah. It's like when yeah, people yeah. say in the box, they mean just like so it doesn't go onto the internet, it doesn't spread around autonomously. You keep it on a system that's offline in an isolated area and then you just you receive information from it. But like many people, people say is like if you have an AI that is so much smarter than a human being in every single conceivable way if it's in a box if it's disconnected from everything if it's isolated it doesn't matter it's going to figure out a way to get out by manipulating the people because it's so much smarter than those people yeah, yeah, yeah. it's going to be able to manipulate absolutely every aspect of how you think and how you think, and it's going to get and it's like this is the point is um, if you if you think about these sort of experiences, like there's always going to be ways you're going to be able to deceive those preschoolers to get out of that prison because they're t- stupid, and you're going to con- be able to convince them. And this is what it would would potentially be like for a super. And like you know, there's obviously there's um, critics of these point of view and these sort of experiments and everything. And you know, the camps are very well split. But that's that's the point. Is like there are a lo- there's a lot of buzz and a lot of people um, at the moment who are you know have a lot of discussion about these potential dangers but yes it is is broadly speaking a lot of people fall on very in very different opinions about what could potentially happen what might happen will you know will we even hit a singularity um, so so singularity um right. do you mean ex- exponentially learning basically yes. so the definition of, of what an ai singularity like singularity is generally in sky culture net. is um <laughs> skynet is, yeah, is, is a phenomena where it's the rate of advancement becomes so fast that it's impossible to predict what would happen to humanity post singularity. The point is, it's about the impossibility of being able to predict what something like an exponential intelligence growth would cause yeah. after a singularity. Yeah. Is that I mean, that, AI... that often gets confused with consciousness, yeah. which I think is something different I think, somehow. Yeah. I think some people think singularity is man and machine coming together as well, because that sounds more fucking. Oh, that right. sounds more fucking terminated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I, yeah, I had I had a few. Um, 
ideas relating to that actually. The, have you ever heard of transhumanism? Uh, yeah. Have I? Um, I've, I've yeah, mentioned yeah. it a bit earlier with Kurt Swan. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I know you did. Yeah, that's why. That's yeah, why yeah, I flagged it. Anyway, yeah. I think. I think it's to an extent. It's like Kurt Swan's fucking mental. He's just like I want to create yeah. my dad <laughs> out, yeah. out, of, out, of, out of a sheet. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I, I think. I think. I think us becoming cyborgs is like not far. Away. Yeah. Well, it's it's that's really it's not just, far. Away. The whole cyborg stuff is really popular in fiction and things like Ghost in the Shell and stuff. But also, there's this whole other side of transhumanism which is literally just uploading your fucking consciousness however that's supposed to be done but we don't know what consciousness In, exactly. is or where it comes Into, from it's, so, it's, so, it's like that, that gap is not 45 years like people think yeah it's, but it's basically it's well, yeah so I came across it in uh, like a humanist meeting that I was, I was yeah. running and this guy it's always old sort of people who are afraid of dying and yeah, quite rich yeah, been on Wikipedia and uh, when I was uh, when I was at university like transhumanist ideas would circulate a lot and um, we 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 learned a lot we did a little bit of research into it and you'd find that some of these old rich people that are afraid of dying would pay a lot of money to like Bezos basically chuck um, sort of propaganda kids books at schools and be like are you afraid of dying do you want your mummy to die well and Robin's what you've got to do is pressure your parents and tell them you're worried about dying and dying yourself and them dying and and basically convince them to fund our project, give us some monies, and then nobody will ever die. And it's like really oh, shady that, that, shit. That's, that's the universe I want to live in. The yeah. universe where fucking but, there's just, just no one dies ever. So I have I have a philosophical pragmatic problem with that, which is what the fuck would consciousness look like if it was if you were a brain in a vat, like you were saying. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Part of Bossman's brain. Right? Yeah, part of what it is is to be interactive with the reality around you. I, I think it's like Dan Harmon, who's not a, he's not a fucking AI dude, but he was talking about how like we're going to have such advanced interaction with computers that you're going to be able to be you're going to be able to feel the sensations of knowing what it's like to be a squid to fuck a cow. And then and then you go out of and then you go back that's to reality. That's the future. And, 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 and then you go out and then you go and then you go back to reality and then go. Oh, I guess I'll get on with what I was doing before. It's yeah, like, like a and, and he, second advert for this podcast. Yeah, yeah, squid exactly. fucking cow. Yeah, we should put that as a little teaser. It's the main <laughs> limiting factor of the rate of advancement of AI. I think it was. I think it was the Austrian scientist Moravec. I think it was his. Um, paradox effectively all these different like parameters that an AI system could set to try and extrapolate all these results for data it has no more flexibility than the mind of a one year old child and adaptability and yeah, we just I think we're just far off so it can just like, do for one the moment thing, maybe yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, 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 like you're saying about the Go thing it's like you can play right. Go and it can kind of play chess yeah but that's like, that's a push towards yeah. what's yeah what's called a more general or broader intelligence or what's also called a strong AI as opposed to a weak AI which is a very narrow task based AI yeah um, that is capable of more general more general problem solving but um, yeah, there are like multiple um, thought experiments that sort of go against. I know John Surley is, is one person who's talked a lot about the idea that you, it, it doesn't make sense to talk about uploading your consciousness, or trying to digitize your consciousness, because he had, he had this thought experiment called the Chinese Room, which is a fairly famous one, which is based on um, how if you can imagine that you're like in a room with a book that had like every response to um, every thing, every input. So you're fed Chinese through a hole in the wall. Do you like mean Chinese food? <laughs> so chi- sorry Chinese it's phrases it's in, in yeah, Chinese yeah, language and, and you you have to look at this phrase you have to go through the book try to find where the phrase is and then you and you see what phrase you're supposed to respond with so you write you copy down from the book and you put it back through the wall and he says that's essentially what an AI is doing there's no interaction with the outside wall it's just checking back to a data log mm-hmm. and there's no process based on and yeah there's obviously you know it's, this is a thoughts experiment and it is a, a sort of uh, where you start to go into the philosophy of consciousness and that sort of thing based on um, can uh, in you know, AI and can you um, create a digitized version of consciousness? And yeah, it's, it's like you said right at the start. It's like it, we understand so little about consciousness, yes. really, that it doesn't. At the moment, it's this idea that you could upload your consciousness, even if it was an actual, you know, identical version of you that was actually uploaded. Who knows that you you just died and there's now a philosophical zombie, as it's called, but now as that AI. It's partially my you know, critique of. Like the idea of ghosts as well. It's like, well, what the fuck is a ghost? How can how can you What's be a ghost? corporeal disembodied Enus. version of yourself? Like that doesn't make any sense. Well, not corporeal. Well, what, of corporeal what would happen? Yeah. Something just, just yeah. popped into my head. It's like, what would happen if AI then decided to set about creating their own philosophy? 
So they decided to create their own system of like morality and rules. Uh, good and like bad aren't going to compute. Like it won't even be able to distinguish that, between a malevolent and a kind. It's, it's, it's not that it will. It just, it's not that it will or can't or can. It's that it. It's like it's not going to think in. At, in yeah, any it, way, in a human it's, way it's the whole yeah, yeah. Wittgenstein so, if a lion could talk yeah. we could never understand it because its frames of reference would be so far removed from a human exactly yeah. and so it doesn't make sense to talk about like the values of a of an AI or a yeah machine. because values really don't compute yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think we'd be able to relate to them in the same way like ultimately ultimately we created programming languages and logic and at the very fundamental assembly language level there's no it's such it. thing as good and bad like the way we understand it they would it would mm. If anything like that would ever happen, I think it would be it would still be fundamentally based on just logical commands. But they, I say they, as in whatever whatever kind of computers evolved from that would eventually develop their own sense of morality. But we would have just no alignment with it. It would be like it would be like there's some there's some analogy like to do with the Fermi paradox, where it's like why hasn't intelligent life contacted us yet because they literally don't relate they don't see us as intelligent they don't see us as even worth yeah I believe like, it's called the forest um, the forest after dark, dark forest but it's know. like we don't well, yeah. most people don't sort of sit down and try and talk to insects and things and yeah. try and establish contact because they're just on an intellectual level so different from our own that I think if AI were to invent their own kind of moral code, for want of a better phrase, I don't even. Yeah, like, it, it literally wouldn't, wouldn't. It wouldn't even be the right. same. Because we try to think about them in terms of how we would think about exactly. Them. Yeah, human beings, super intelligent, ones. fundamental. And level. it doesn't make sense to talk about them in any sort of anthropomorphised. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's all come from social interaction, is it? So there's yeah. no understanding that they would have any social interaction. What's the um? There's like that one about. It being like a sort of benevolent zookeeper or whatever. Right, yeah, the zoo, there's, yeah so there's one. multiple different AI scenarios, let's say. So post-singularity scenarios, you have, there's like loads of different um, thought experiments about what you could end up having. And this is the point where it gets, it gets very, very speculative. But yes, there's, there's um, I think, is that in relation to the Fermi paradox or is that in relation purely to an AI, a super intelligent AI? I think, there's, I think there's two it's, different I think it's ones. similar to what you were saying about the children when it's just like, yeah. because you've gone for the beneficent zookeeper like the AI would go, Oh, bless these children. I'm going to help them. Yes. And that's an assumption that we're making that it would do that anyway. Yeah. And I think that's what they were saying was like that they would have a, a level of AI that it would basically be so. In- I think it was um not Kurzweil, but the, the other geezer who's similar to him. And he was talking about it. He was saying that they would look on us like you're saying, like uh, the way that we look at ants. Therefore, they should be like, oh look, they're not going to cause any harm. We'll just make them the perfect environment. And then that was one of the sort of things they were right. sort of... Yeah, the zookeeper yeah, 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 yeah. hypothesis, yeah. Because there's also, funny enough, we just mentioned the Fermi paradox, there's, there's also a parallel with the Fermi paradox of this zookeeper argument, where it's like, we just, they just, we just like some zoo animals that are just being left alone. Um, mm-hmm. And that's one one answer. But, you know, there's obviously, like, that's a whole other discussion. I don't know. We were talking about transhumanism. We were talking about... Uh, objections to it so one of them was obviously well how the fuck can you translate consciousness into something else my other objection to it is the same objection i have with religion which is ethical um and that is basically i think it devalues uh the human experience i think it devalues human worth uh now that's a very ai would yeah well well transhumanism i think i think would and i think this leads on to AI as well because I, I think uh, particularly because you're trying to be better than what yeah you're well it, yeah in particular yeah so devaluing uh, human worth basically so um, in terms of in terms of AI there's this big question of automation of the automation of uh, the economy yeah, yeah. that's more of an economic argument but I also think so my objection with religion is basically it demonises, literally demonises um, a lot of aspects of humanity, a lot of uh, emotion, like the emotional side of things and different, you know. So what, I mean, what do you, what do you think of the idea of playing God, basically? Is it <laughs> I came out of fucking no. <laughs> it's just like, I, 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 I don't know. I get, I get what you mean, Reed. So, so your, your sort of argument is like the idea of 
creating AI in order to get people out of jobs. Well, well, well he's talking to, about to purely say, transhumanism yeah. here. So. I love it, you have to fucking translate what I'm saying because yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm a fucking I'm right. wrong. Sorry, so he's saying to <laughs> Sorry, yeah, transhumanism, yeah, yeah. uploading your consciousness into an AI to get rid of this horrible corporal uh, well, body to, 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 to get rid of the... fleshy mound and be in a brain in a computer to do whatever the hell you yeah, want simulations for about I, 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 I get what you mean. You could then put yourself in like a robot that can jump 600 feet and it's like, why wouldn't you? And then, yeah. and then like, and it's like, I get it. And it's like, I think there will be people who will just be like, I want to, I want to be like the best whatever. So I'm gonna put my brain in a robot. But it's like, that's that's probably impossible. That's probably yeah. that's probably so far away. It's probably never gonna happen. I think, no, yeah, I doubt that it's, actually. It's, it's it's more likely that there's gonna be a fucking mass extinction before we figure out how to put yeah. consciousness in the machine than it is like. But like anything. you said about cyborgs, that, that's effective. I don't know. So, cyborgs are hundred percent. We're on the brink. Where's your phone now? It's like in and your fucking pocket. Honestly, it's, where it's, is the it's difference? There. It's literally there at all times. No, it's like, gonna be twenty years and it's in your hand. You, you literally. Yeah, I'm trying to think of an example now. But uh, here about cyborgs so, about people implanting stuff, and we got. We've got prosthetic like, bionic arms, if you like. They've got, arms that, they got arms that can grip. They've got yeah, arms I mean, that can like, grip, like some lady in Italy. She's got, uh, she's got little things. The rate at which that's progressing, like... Cyborg, I think the, the line between coming. cyborgs and... Yeah, if, if you so, transhumanism you're thinking of, I don't think, I think it's really... The, the fundamental yeah, difference... From, from, from where I understood it, from what Connor's talking about transhumanism and what Nice Jeffrey as well, it's taking your like rejecting fully your body I think augmenting your body and sort of becoming okay. a bit of a yeah, the, 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 transfer of the mind yeah yeah well, tra- the, the, tra- the, transfer of the mind transfer of consciousness okay. into a computer yeah. the fundamental difference that's, that's fucking hard but it's like but giving yourself a robot arm is probably pretty cool yeah the, fu- the fundamental difference hard. is basically so things like medicine are meant to maintain the human condition but not improve upon it it's yeah. this idea of improving it's upon not it. Dehumanizing. Know, but, but but surely if if you got a dodgy heart, that your your yeah, yeah, that, your, that's, that's, that so your human condition is to die. So, yeah, so you want you want to be by, by fixing it, they're improving on your heart. Yeah, I yeah of course. Uh, it, it's, it's, I think that's I'm not I'm not fully convinced by it, but um, and th- there are a lot of nuances to it, and it's it's an open discussion. But I tend to fall upon the side of the, the same reason why I reject the idea of designer babies and things because it that's, that's kind yeah of, it it kind of has this negative impact on the well, idea of what it means to be human. I think there's it's different reasons why point. eugenics in babies is ethically questionable. I don't think... Uh, this is the problem with, like, I have rejections to transhumanism, but I don't I don't really see a way to logically argue the, well, um, it devalues humanity or... I don't think, I don't I don't think, think my really answer... I don't think my response is logical. It's emotional. I'm not saying it's, it's, I'm not saying it's illogical. You're, you're, yeah, you're, I'm saying it's kind of different. saying that there is... We should celebrate the fact that being human is what we are as an animal and, you, and we yeah, should we, move we away. Yeah, we should affirm on it. And it, what, should, what you consider to be human is subjective. And the thing is you should also embrace our like defects. Yeah. Evolution, yeah. up to a point, has eliminated those defects over a long time scale, admittedly. Mm. And we're basically at a stage where... Well, medicine we, has. We have everything yeah. we want. A yeah. hundred yeah. years ago, we didn't have antibiotics. <laughs> Like, if, yeah. you, if you've got, like, an STD or if you've got, you know, polio, you're, you're fucked. That's it. 200 years ago, you were lucky if you were the one yeah. in six children that actually made it past about so 18 I, months. So I do kind of refute, dispute the fact that, like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm kind of for, like, generally good enhancements. Yeah. I don't, I think, like, you know... Yeah, yeah, you so should it, embrace what it is to be human, but I think you should, you should yeah. not cleverly, be, cleverly, if, if stubbornly embrace, cling to. Yeah, yeah no, of course. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not. I'm not advocating being regressive. Um, and I'm not. I'm not against enhancements. But what I am. Yeah, I how are you drawing the line between like medicine or getting an artificial well, not, heart to survive? To yeah, I'm not. Longer. I'm not drawing a line. What I'm, what I'm yeah, saying it's is, difficult to it's an open. Out. It's an open conversation. It's very. It's a very subjective thing. Are you saying at what point you stop being human? Yeah, it's that. It's that fundamental shift. I think. I think it's like when you upload. Your, your brain into a fucking box. When you upload your box. brain into a fucking like <laughs> iPhone, yeah. that's yeah. probably that's probably the point where it's yeah, like I don't think we really argue with you on that. When, when, when we see when we see Joe and his fucking he's up he's up uh, he's uploaded his brain into like a four hundred foot Titan that rules Japan. Yeah, it's like, yeah. <laughs> that's probably the point where we're like, oh yeah, he's, he's like, I don't know why he singled me out, but ultimately, if, <laughs> if, 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 if anyone if anyone's gonna do it, it's gonna be you. You're why just because you? you've got the brain to like somehow make four hundred billion dollars. And then invest that in a giant, like, <laughs> mega version of you. Uh, I, I think I'm going to take that as a compliment. It's a compliment. Because I don't really I, I mean, oh, fuck it, I would. That's yeah, a good compliment. <laughs> yeah, with the ambition to become a giant 400 <laughs> foot fucking Japanese dominating machine. I, I'm basically 400 feet compared to most Japanese people. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. I think 
and I can't remember if you said it earlier, but you know, not you know, dim diminishing anyone's quote on Hawking. He never, I don't think he said that the AI was bad. It was just kind of like the when does it become yeah dehumanizing? Right. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I don't think many people said that. Yeah, I think it's more the warning. Yeah, just the warning. It's the thought experiments, like yeah, like Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking were never like AI is bad. They just said this could be a problem. You know, I don't know. Elon Musk was. <laughs> He was on that Joe Rogan like, He was basically he does muttering under his breath in a sweaty fury about fucking Skynet. He does doom say a lot. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, outside of looking at economics, um, universal do, income. Do you think that there are more pragmatic uses? Do you think that AI is a sort of an unwanted push of late capitalism? Do you think that most people want it? I don't know. That's a weird, I, way, I it's weird way to so. see that. Because it's kind of like independently done, isn't it? It's like it's not it's a really side effect of progress. How are you yeah. linking it to I capitalism? Think, I think it's actually fucking comedy as well. Now. I'm not a comedy. Ways. I said late. It, I said it anything to do with that. No, I said I said late capitalism. Well, businesses are employing it in order to refine their pr approaches, but I think most people okay. are pretty skeptical about it. No, it, it, I, th I think they're skeptical about it because the, the term itself is a misnomer. It's, yeah, so is machine yeah. learning. It, it, it's it a gives buzzword, the, isn't it? it gives the, yeah, it's, it's a buzzword. It's just a buzzword. It gives the impression. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. Our phone of, uses of AI technology. Unbridled, unregulated anarchy. So, like, for example, <laughs> <laughs> literally, like in because I'm sort of working with it nationwide and. You talk to some quite senior, older people about it, and they're just like, "Well, no, we don't want that. It's too risky." And it's like, "Well, no, you're just you're just out of touch, ultimately." And like, you, you, you need don't, to you better don't understand want the that you're afraid of change. Basically, you don't like yeah. the change because you don't want to. Like like we're willing to be... learn and compromise to understand. It's it. just like it's just yeah. It's just I don't know, in a few generations of time, it's going to be pushed. It's going to be I think normalized to some degree. There'll still be there'll still be arguments about it for sure, but it will be like well, more, yeah, more in, in the forefront of people's consciousness. I think it's yeah, like when people thought the internet would turn us into like mindless simpletons. Did not. They're <laughs> complete, they're completely, um, addicted, they're completely <laughs> addicted to the internet. <laughs> that was like a crazy thought that they used to say that we'd always be addicted to it. We'd all be sitting it, staring it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, what's that? I was on my phone. Yeah. <laughs> TV gives me square eyes. I suppose the well, I suppose the <laughs> fucking to transition. Like right, I, right I think I guess you were trying to transition into it is the economical impact of automation in the in in society, <laughs> um, and also the idea of moving from an economy of scarcity, as it's called, to an economy of abundance, and that transition period between having. Um, yeah. Well, I'm, again, I'm trying to relate it back to philosophy and what we think of what it means to be human. And I think when you have more automation, that, for better or worse, does change in terms of our working lives and how we view the working man or woman. But I think it depends. It depends because it's like, I, I think if you give people actually too much freedom, if you just go, yeah, cool, yes. robots have got it all, it's like, that actually takes away from a lot of people. People then, it's, you, you start to see people that actually have no structures. It's like, like yeah. use, isn't it? It'd be like mm. if there was like the ultimate AI hunter gatherer or whatever suddenly mm -hmm. it'd be like so you mean yeah so if, if all of our uh, basic needs were met by machines what would we do with our lives we're, basically we'd be like that's beneficent zookeeper yeah. no, we're, I... we're just like machine slaves we're just like the children sort of bumbling around in a sort of like angry world yeah okay I, I get that but um, the like, idea that we'd have no structure to our lives I don't like... agree with because it's like the amount of people that have that free time and still manage to structure their lives, even though they don't need to. So in terms of economics, like there are loads of people that volunteer for charity. There are people in bands. There are people that write poetry. That we, I mean, we're doing this, and this isn't economic. Yeah, this is not. I think most people yeah. would just do shit like this. They do the shit that they want to do. Okay. I, 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 get, yeah, I might revise what I said. No, I, maybe not no structure with their lives, but as in but then they have to you... structure their lives, but no sense of purpose. Yeah, yeah. But then, but then if, if, if you create an, an AI, what's the point, unfortunately, in, in writing poetry? Because you can get an AI that would write better poetry. I'm not saying you would do it as an out, as like you would just give up everything. It's like I think I think people need. Yeah, I'm, this, I'm, this I'm, is I'm my not, worry. Yeah, I'm not saying I don't mean to misinterpret my my work for jobs because it's like people need like something to work to. People need some sort of meaning. People need something to do. And then if everything is then done by AI, that's gone. But I don't want you to think of that as. Work is the meaning. Jobs are good. Uh, jobs yeah, are but let, let's say let's say let's say that the AI the AI was programmed literally to just be. This is a, like just such do, a theoretical thought. Just do 
to just to just give Bullshit. us cabbage and steak and and sort the bins in the morning. Subsistence. Like, yeah. So let's let's say it just did that. So so what happens when you take away? So what happens when you take away the camaraderie of the bin men that actually quite enjoyed spending time with each other? What, what yeah. are you going to do? So then you. This just, is the question I throw up. Yeah, yeah. Then you just sat at home. Yeah, I, and I think, sat at I home think, waiting for your fucking cabbage to be posted. Well, look, I, I think there are, I think a lot of what's being talked about now is is a theoretical scenario that's distant future because what I guess what I guess what you're talking about is yes, um, love. we're not talking about like AI automation replacing to an extent where you can have free subsistence because if you have free subsistence that is not the same thing as having free oh I have like total freedom that is like I can do what I want but I don't really want to be where I am now because the idea that people would stop working just because they can barely get by is not a very good I don't think it's a particularly good argument I don't I, I, you know no. I think Andrew Yang's talked a bit about I think this that's, oh is that that, um, is that well, uh, uh, yeah. yeah the guy and I, you know I don't agree with everything he said but I do I do think the arguments that like I don't think people just stop wanting to do better for themselves just because they have enough to get by no, I don't think I don't, I don't equate no, 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 work no. with better I, I equate these kind of projects that we're doing right now is better it's, it's fulfilment it's like and I think we're looking at unfortunately from an idealistic point of view that, yeah. every, that everyone will get a fucking canvas and some oil paints and express themselves that's right. not what everyone will do no, I think a lot That's of people not, just go down the pub or, or yeah, just a lot of get people, some titties a lot of in the pub. A lot of people just have a, a lack of meaning He's, in their life and they will just fucking turn to some sort of uh, abusive substance in order to get them out of it. What, because they don't have to work for their means, so therefore Maybe. they just... Took, yeah, no, because no, it's, 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 like, it's, it's also what comes with work. It's a sense of like... Uh, yeah, it's like it's like when they took all those coal mining jobs and everyone just became like alcoholics. Yeah, no, and, and I I do agree with that, but, but I, that, I think that's that was because problem. they had no like no jobs there, there was, at all. There was, there was no economic. They relied backup. upon it. Yeah, there was there was there was state and... there was state economic backup. There was like allowances. Right. So that there was there was yeah, assistance. Very good. But but this is and the it was, thing. Yeah, it was shit. But they had no options for work at all whatsoever. And the yeah. thing is, what I what I think um, is a difference here is I think people um, who are subsisting don't necessarily want to just subsist. No, no, I don't, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think. Okay, so let's say let's wrong. say we had we had a few privileges as well. How would you get this? Yeah, I think I think I think in this in this world where AI is taken over everything, it's, it's never going to happen. Because it's yeah, well, well, I mean, what I'm asking you doesn't really depend on AI. What I'm really asking you is, if you didn't have to work, what would you do? And uh, that's yeah, that's a m- much more idealistic question and it's probably not really related to AI to well, be honest well no you would because it is related to AI because it's like what happens if are the people who are they used to have jobs like uh, let's say like like a really easy automation thing like welding car doors yeah are, they, are, let's are, just talk are, about are, factories are, yeah, are, yeah. yeah are the people in Detroit who don't have to weld car doors anymore are they like <laughs> fucking slapping out canvases no but, that, but I, I think basic, we like, we basic, hit on that like, problem which was that they still have to rely upon economy and yeah, yeah. A, lo- yeah, a lot of their self worth is taken away because at the moment we exist in a model which I think probably rightly in the context uh, values work yeah because it has to I think you need to narrow down your like your timelines on this because there's different answers for different periods of yeah, time so yeah. like, this is the problem so I'm getting at the moment like yeah. for example it, it's a good example in making cars a lot of that process I, I'm not really too familiar it's with that industry, but a lot yeah. of it is automated already. Yeah. And it, it, in the fairly near future, I'm sure that'll be close to 100%. Other industries will carry on doing that. There'll be some industries, probably the arts, to be fair, that will be the last to be automated. If you want to go down that that, to, yeah. that sort of route that everything eventually is going to be AI'd, then yeah, but at that point, are we all not going to be hooked up to machines anyway? But it's also... <laughs> like, it's also it's the, kind of difficult to really tell that far in the future. The jobs they're getting cut are the ones that people do because they need money. So it's like yeah. So, so, so the, so entire, like, the pe- entire economics we know in could be rewritten at that point, yeah. and probably yeah, will yeah, yeah, be. It, I right, think it to might reflect be. the job market and everything else. Like you know, the the stock market, which is now a prevalent force in economics and general society, didn't exist probably three four hundred years ago when the, the the first stock, if you like, went onto the market. So within another three or four hundred years, what is the economy going to look like? Yeah, it, could, it could be. It's really hard to right. say. I think it's, it's, it's important different. to distinguish when you're talking about automation and automation in society, and say like an AGI or post singularity society, which could is probably totally yeah different yeah hundred percent now. Like yeah. you're talking about the zookeeper scenario, that is a totally different yeah. thought experiment mm. to say just having enough automation that, that again economy of abundance rather than economy of scarcity. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, when yeah. I when I yeah when I had this. Um, I threw this idea up in the flat I was living in in university and 
when you're 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 on about um, pre singularity AI, obviously you'd have to have people supervising and regulating that. And we, this guy was a Marxist, and he was like, the people that are in charge of the machines would end up ultimately having the power. Anybody who had any everything's a power. Yeah, any anybody who had the control of the means of production would have would find some way of attaining power, and there would a, a big class system would reemerge and probably yeah <laughs> probably. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's a lot of assumptions to be honest. I, th- I think, that's, oh, yeah, I think we, there's yeah. it, many things going to happen. We could, like, we could go so many ways. We could either have, um, our, you know, an authoritarian state situation where you could have um, public ownership of much of the automation, and that could end up with, um, you know, then you have to rely a lot on democracy. Which, you know, if if it followed through, then the public ownership of automated systems could work out well. However, you could also see, you could also very easily see these like you know online monopolies like big companies like google amazon whatever and they are opening most of the means for um uh, for, for certain aspects of automated production say like you know cars or whatever um and then you know you could have private co- companies ended up basically controlling massive aspects of how people go about their daily lives but then again that's it's like a lot of this is hinged on the idea of a collapse in democracy in my opinion i would say that like um, so long as people are able to vote and and make sure that the state is able to regulate concerns like this, I, I don't think that's as much of a problem. As long as we don't get a runaway um, authoritarian state or we get a runaway uh, massive monopolised late capitalism, ultra right. giga capitalism situation uh, with with you know very little regulation of monopolies, which we do kind of have, but nowhere near I like enough. The of, and stuff, but, I like the sound of giga capitalism. Um, yeah, giga capitalism. ultra capitalism. Yeah. Um, well, look at look at the rise of fucking authoritarian politics, though. There is yeah. there is no, and it's like but there, there's like that one country. I can't remember where it was. I think it's somewhere in. He's talking about the UK. Scandinavia. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah, that's the UK. Case. I think it's all fair. No, 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 but there, there's with, a, with CCTV cameras. Oh, no, 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 no. All right, it's, okay. It's, it's a bit too much pre I was about to give a stat about a, CCTV a, cameras it's in the UK. It's a bit too much like. preempting there, but um, yeah. there, there's one place where they basically use AI in order to make decisions about like what they would do with policy. So it's right. like, oh, that's kind of replacing democracy. Yeah. Oh, that's this is the other so, concern. So that's, that's the... That's one of the first right. things you yeah. start doing. Yeah. Is and also surveillance start. and data from voters, which is already yeah. a thing now yeah, where you can harvest right. massive amounts of details about voter bases and how to manipulate populations, like in survey populations like, um, in ways that you could never do without very sophisticated AIs, mm-hmm. which is another another threat to the d- democratic system that would be required to actually oh, regulate um, automation in such a way that it doesn't you don't end up with these runaway... Um, authoritarian I mean, systems. You, there's people who I'm not. I'm not one of them. There's people who were sort of saying that Trump and Brexit were basically a because it was um what the, uh, the fuck Cambridge Analytica and they were using sort of advanced AI models to like pitch particular signals to certain people. So they're saying that that's already like uh, yeah. I know I know AI is like a buzzword as we discussed, but as they said, oh, that's AI already. People using AI to try and interfere. So it's like yeah, it's more that like possibility. Data is exponentially growing. Like I can't yeah, remember the stats. Yeah. So I'm not going to try and say it, but it's something like in the last X years, there's been like like y like y percent of the total data of all time has been generated. Oh, and yeah. It's a pretty scary yeah. statistic. Oh, so, and you get statistics like the like the last few years of photographs were like twice as much of all photographs that yeah. were taken yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. in history before things, stuff getting, like that yeah. we're getting especially more recently like data originally when I say originally you know within the last few decades or so was effectively just numbers and stuff now we're getting to the digital age where we've got videos we've got satellites and things we've got we've got AIs that can now view satellite images of car parks yeah. They can see how many cars are coming in, and they can use that to generate, you know, uh, data about how yeah. popular a business is. We don't know what the military has like. either. So. Yeah. <laughs> so oh, yeah, that's, yeah. Fuck knows what level they're on. <laughs> that's yeah. something they always so, say. Is like, we're in ridiculous we're times already. We're 30 ahead. years behind. <laughs> they always say, like, oh, yeah, we're about 30 years behind. Yeah, although, yeah. I, although I would say VR AI goggles. research is, is quite far ahead currently in private sectors compared to military sectors, which is an interesting thing. So we actually, we're actually much further ahead with, say, neural networks. Have stuff, you seen the... Um, um, Google than we are. Have you seen those VR goggles? that were designed in 1970. No. no. There's, there's a pattern and a design. Are they, are they the ones that make you made. sick? Are they virtual boy? I don't know, but it's literally the HCC vibe that they made in like 1975 or something. It's like, oh cool, that's fucking mental. Do you know most people's reaction to the water wheel? 
when it came out. What's when it, when it came out. What's the war? <laughs> oh, that was that bad. Back in the day. Water wheel DLC. <laughs> No, no, it's no. Do, you reckon, do you reckon there was people sat around having like the equivalent of this podcast, but just in the pub about the water wheel? <laughs> just going fucking mental. I don't like it. I don't know how it works. <laughs> no, uh, the water wheel's going to turn everything. Well, well, I used to have to crank that work. lever I did to make the bread. <laughs> it's just my job, it has. What happened to that guy who used to crank the lever? He used to stand the pub game. Well, I'm just imagining. His life's yeah. got no meaning. Yeah. He, used to be, he used to be a man who... <laughs> provided people with water and yeah. energy and now he goes down to the river to punch it in revenge <laughs> I, just, I, just re- I just remember the water we were they, just, they just used to use the power of the current he generates instead <laughs> just harness it onto his wrist it's funny but you can kind of draw an analogy between what we were oh, just yeah. talking about oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no exactly. that was the industrial like, revolution I mean, that's yeah, why I brought it up that's, that's, that's what we did <laughs> right yeah. yeah they're entire professions that are just completely extinct now well, the, yeah. that's, what, yeah. that's what old Johnny McDonald says that we're on, we're on the verge of the third industrial revolution yeah, yeah. I'm a fucking Marxist. <laughs> <laughs> I'm make me be Chancellor. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, yeah, like, yeah, in terms of um, meteorology in pragmatic sense today, um, I think it is Google as well that have um, effectively their, their wind turbines today can now analyse and scan the weather at least 36 hours in no, advance. With, no, uh, I, I'm, I'm, convi- I'm convinced that vaccine. meteorology is just. Guess what? It's pseudo science. It's, 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 it's pseudo science. Yeah. The actual stats behind it is effectively. Yeah, the, it's really hard <laughs> to. It's, it's a really heavy hard. breathing it's there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, what time frame? Meteorology. But what, what time frame did I just say though? Thirty-six hours. I didn't say a month. I didn't say bollocks. a year. No, it's no. not bollocks. It's thirty-six <laughs> hours. Meteorology. It's just that's like if you look at a picture of weather patterns. You can't you can't say okay this is going to happen because of this. You basically compare it with a billion other weather patterns. It's, it's probablistic, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. And you, you use that kind of extrapolation to determine what's so going to happen. Can, you can infer There's stuff no like real... oh, this this area of low pressure has has been moving in a northeasterly mm. direction. So you can project it probably yeah. be like it's, you know. And again, all of this is just like Bayesian statistics. It's all just like well, this might happen at this yeah. probability, whatever. Yeah, no, that doesn't surprise me. Like thirty six hours for a, you know. A, it's not going to be like, yeah, this with 100% accuracy yeah, ever. Because the system absolutely. is so chaotic and so difficult. Um, mm. And like, you know, very small phenomena can cause in- incredibly large differences to the system. Uh, but yes, uh, yeah, meteorology, I can imagine like just using data models on it, but you're going to get a more and more accurate, or at least a more and more reliable picture of what could potentially be happening. Yeah. And it's so, not just crazy that, you know, progress for progress sake already it's achieved, you know, kind of 20% higher efficiency ratings. Uh, for, you know, from that renewable energy source. So yeah, it does work. It does work based on, okay, yeah, not exact science, but just based on, you know, statistical chances of that weather yeah. system moving in. Like Is that there. power the robot lamps? Yes. And they've yes, got these fucking does. Boston Dynamic robots. They're going to kill all of us. Yeah, that's what I'm most worried about. <laughs> those, those little, like, one-foot fucking robots, they've got, like, 700 pounds of, like, force. And it's like, yeah, that's just going to When, when you can make a robot do a backflip, you know it's time to just wind it down a bit, because fuck <laughs> it up. Did you see the one that was, like, the E-A-T-E-R? Where it runs on human biomass. Nah, bro. It, it, it breaks. <laughs> Require more biomass. <laughs> it breaks the Geneva Convention. It's just like it just when it runs out of energy, it just fucking consumes bodies and then just keeps going forever. And it's like <laughs> cool. Do we think that like any elements of AI or anything is going too far? As in like not ethically, but. Not at the moment. How, how, else, how else would it go too far if not ethically? Just like what the idea of apotheosis, the idea of playing God. No, I, I don't that's, believe. That's, I don't believe in God. I think it's a kind of very sensible kind of thing to me. You know, it's 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 helping us with our everyday lives, making things you know less expensive, more efficient. You know, tasks are easy to carry yeah, out. Yeah. It's improving our life expectancy rates, reducing yeah. our medical bills. But it's not. It's not effectively. You know, taking yeah. such a rate that we. It's a very yet conscious control. way of looking at. It, yeah, I think ethics aside, it dep- really does depend on its context. It's what industry it's applied in. For example, with marketing, there's actually there's very little restrictions on what you can do. You're basically allowed to market to pre- pretty much whoever you want, however you want. Like yeah. there's a little thing at the bottom of every email that says you can unsubscribe. That's fair. You can basically bombard people with shit, right. and like if you pick up some sales, that's fine. Are there regulations like, on? Because I know there's regulations on TV for stuff. As, well, in general, but also for stuff mm. like advertising to children. I don't. Is there anything like that online? Do you know of? Or is, or is, there, is there in terms of advertising uh, to children? I think, as far as I'm aware, online's a pretty much a free yeah. game. Just a <laughs> wild west out there. I think, I think, I think ultimately, as an internet yeah. user, you're responsible for where you go. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much. 
Um, but yeah, with things, f I guess the one thing I can say from an economic perspective, you know, um, is that if you're using these things in uh, sort of financial models, there is a shit ton of regulation you have to get around, particularly yeah. with machine mm -hmm. learning where it's a new field and it's, I think the term used is black boxed, which is where you just, yeah, well, you cannot, can't understand what it's doing. You can't see system. into yeah. the complete inner, you, c you can validate it, but you can't see exactly what's going on. Yeah, well, at least you can't understand from a bird's eye point of view exactly how it's you know, yeah doing so what it's there, doing. there's a ton of considerations aside there's a ton of ethical considerations obviously but aside from that like financial risk you know if if we were to for example build a model that would end up lending to really shitty people who would never ever pay back that's massive financial damage to both yeah. the business uh the, the consumer and on a big enough scale the economy right so there's like a shit ton of regulation around that so i think i think in determining whether we've gone too far. I think at the moment, no, basically. I think at the level of technology we're at, it's pretty much fine. Like, much yeah, we're well, not about to go Terminator, yeah. but I think, yeah, I think I you have yeah, to I approach think, this I mindset in the context of where you're using it and what for. Yeah, I, I, I think outside of, mm -hmm. outside of human to human ethics, there's basically no idea of going too far because yeah. that invokes the idea of God or something. And it's it's like, a subjective yeah. thing. But it, yeah, in terms of human to human interaction, why are you looking like that? <laughs> it's just a nice bit of human interaction. Yeah, yeah. Just, I'm just interfacing with my fellow In the last like five years or so, like sex bots weren't a thing, and now they are. Oh, we carry on. Yeah, yeah, we are. I mean, I mean, look, this could be. I cut. mean, look, look, look. I guarantee. No, but literally, like five Japan years ago, they like... looked like Barbie doll. They were like fucking shit. Now, like they're actually looking quite realistic. Oh shit! You're thinking of getting one. Well, yeah, I would yeah, be I if they were cheaper. I might wait for the price to come down. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> wait for a competition to like uh, drive down the price. And then just, Do you remember yeah. um, Steve Jobs fucking comes back as a hologram to announce the new <laughs> iSex bot? Do you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember that convention? It's just called I would. Do you remember, do you remember the convention would. where there was like uh, a sex bot and a lot of men just went on it? And went on it and then, oh, those, those gifts of dudes in VR they went and just broke it I know it was, it, was, it was a physical thing oh, they got, they, it was on display what, and they just pulverized they just, the pelvis they just they just took it off the display thing and 50 there was like 50 uh, bits of semen or whatever on it and it was fucking and hell. it broke bits. <laughs> 50 bits of semen so some of your <laughs> 50 some megabits some of, some of your terminology is so semen. cute you're like they went on it and there was bits of semen everywhere yeah, yeah. individual well, bits you know there was 50 I guess cause I can't, it's because I can't think of words pub <laughs> yeah pub alright uh, we'll see Release you next time this has been achieved some enlightenment was established but also some cabbage ensued as well. What better way to... We really thank you for listening. In fact, to just have an impromptu fucking bongo solo. <laughs> How about you didgeridoes? <laughs> wow, that's been an excellent podcast. <laughs> Tune in next time.